best boxing content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and punch that bell for notifications. Boxing Will Weekly, speaking with the legendary cup men, Jacob Duran, or better known as Stitch. It's funny that that became your nickname, obviously, I think because of your profession, but I do want to start, I've, I've heard about your story, but for our audience, I'd like them to hear your story from, from you. So I want to know how it all, how it all got started. Yeah, well, let me go with the name Stitch first. Uh, they're filming a documentary in my life. Anyway, thanks for having me on, Cole. It's always good, man. You're, you guys are doing a great job, and I just see the growth in you and, and uh, see where you'll be at five years from now. Right? <laughs> thanks, so, man. Anyway, during the, for the documentary they're filming, I, I wrote a book called From the Fields to the Garden. The fields were that I was a farm worker, you know, born and raised in the migrant camp, right? And uh, the garden is Madison Square Garden. So we've already gotten all that anyway. I'm in the Creed movie, so when they interviewed, uh, Michael came forward and and we got some nice interviews and all that. But he said one of the one of the points he's bringing up, he says, yeah, you know, Stitch is wrapping my hands, and all of a sudden Stitch says, hey Michael, do you know my real name? And he says, Stitch. He says, no, 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 no. Do you know my real name? I'm asking him, right? And he says, uh, no. And he says, hey, anybody here know Stitch's real name? And uh, they said, no. Nah. I said, no. Nah. I said, it's Jacob. You know, so, yeah, it's not uh, it's not widely known, at least in this generation of combat sports, what uh, my real name is. Yeah, I and I want to know, when did that transit, like, when, when did that happen? When it became, you know, you were better known as Stitch than you were as Jacob Durant? D yeah, that... You know, that happened and, and nicknames should be given to you, right? Yeah. Uh, through some kind of honor or some kind of a uh, point of, of your combat. Like, uh, so uh, I had a school of kickboxing and I was working with Dennis Alexio, which was at that point the heavyweight champion of the world. Bad, badass boy. Best athlete I ever met in my life. Well, one of his sparring partners, Dave Rooney, is fighting on the same card and I'm working his fights and I'm making the transition from being a coach to being a cut man, learning all the skills. And and he ended up with a small cut and I know nothing. I just applied pressure and he ended up winning the fight. And I got the little pieces of tape, little, and I ripped them like a butterfly and I closed it. And he says, ah, oh, I don't have to go to the hospital. You send me some stitches, I'm gonna call you Stitch. So, you know, I'll, I'll just say this for the longest time that I don't even know if Dave Rooney, last thing I heard, he was a fisherman in Alaska. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, so I always said, I didn't, I don't know if Dave Rooney ever knew how much he changed my life. Well, about a month ago, I get one of my kickboxers from those days that called me just to say, you know, I just want to let you know, man, and you know, you were a big impact in my life. And you know, you and Charlotte, my wife were like my parents. I just want to tell you, I love you. And so I told him the thing about Dave Rooney and he says, hell, he's uh, he's chartering bus or uh, boats in San Francisco. So wow. if I go back to the Bay Area, I'm gonna try to look uh, uh, Dave Rooney and let him know that he kind of uh, changed my name, you know. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. And uh, one thing that I've known in reading up your story and listening to some other interviews is that it does seem like even for a cut man, you seem to leave an impact on these fighters. And I want to know if, you know, if there's like a method that you have to, you know, your relationship with these guys. A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, I, uh, it's funny you bring this up because I just, uh, I just went to the, Oh, uh, oh, Oakland Raiders, that's where I was from. The Las Vegas Raiders training camp. And uh, they're teaching some of these Raiders on the off season, the boxing. So they want me to go by and, ma and wrap the hands of Max Crosby. And so I get there and I wrap his hands, but I'm telling him the stories of how, uh, listen man, here's what you guys, you guys are all modern day gladiators. Anybody that makes contact, you're modern day gladiators, but deep inside, you're all babies. And my job is to take care of the baby. And you know, he, he understands. Uh, but the same thing with fighters, you know, is, is they're going into battle and, and uh, they know I got their back, right? So I'm gonna let you listen to something that Vladimir sent me uh, that very few people have heard. Okay. So when I was doing the Creed movie, Michael, they always used me as an advisor, right? Cause, but I told him I wanna make sure this is done as proper as could be. So he asked me who should give away the WBC belt during one of the fights. And so I gave him the story of, it was created by Jose Suleiman. He's the president uh, from Mexico City. He passed away. His son Mauricio now is 
is is running uh, the WBC. So I gave him that. So there was they picked the guy out that I suggested, and he's the one that's giving the belt away. Right, wow. got him in the movie. Right, wow, 250 extras, and you know everybody wants to be in a position, right? Yeah. So I picked him, and he was like the only Mexican in the audience. We're in Atlanta, so I picked him, and and uh, lo and behold, the the one. So anyway, I when Earl Spots. Errol Spence Farugas in Dallas, I ran into Mauricio and I explained to him the story. And he says, uh, cause both Vladimir and Vitaly that I work with both WBC champions. Yeah. He says, well, let's send the, these guys a, a, a picture. Cause you know, they're in the middle of the battle. Vitaly is the mayor of Kiev. Vladimir is him and Zelensky, they're the face of, of the Ukraine, you know, for yeah. support and all that. So we sent him a picture and Vladimir uh, came back with this and I'm going to let you listen to it. All right. So all right. You, you for sure, hundred percent are the first Canadian. So here we go. Let me see. Here we go. My two favorite men, specialist stage with whom I spent so much time talking and he actually saved my career yeah, on a lot of different stages. Uh, if stitch wouldn't be in my corner, I would not nick the record of 12 years being a champion. So um, that's uh, so great to see you both. And Stitch is the man. You know, wow. that, that, that kind of says it all, right? And, and uh, but that's the relationship I have with these guys, you know? And uh, like, uh, I'll give you a story with Vitaly or Vladimir on his last fight uh, when he lost his title to Anthony Joshua. I didn't see him till him and Vitaly till Friday at the weigh-ins because my daughter Carla had gotten married and so and so and so I see him at the weigh-ins and we go through how you doing what's going on you know we go through our, our business you know but but as personal and then finally as as we're starting to go with this at the weigh-ins I put my hand on Vladimir's shoulder and I said look don't worry about nothing tomorrow I'll take care of you like you're my son and I leave because I know that night they can't sleep. Man, Cole, I'm putting the final Vaseline on him right before Michael Buffer does the announcements. 90,000 people in Wembley Stadium, crazy, you know, sound like 150,000 people all over the world that he looks at me and we're this far apart and he says, you could call me son. Bro, that blew me away because, you know, I knew I'd gotten into his mind. And then uh, he called me and, hey, daddy. But <laughs> going forward, the last time I spoke to him was in Germany and simply as a Vladimir, that moment. Why? I hate you. He says, Stitch, he goes, there's very few people I trust in my life. You are one of them. That's now amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. You know, that's what I, I find it so just insanely curious that that uh, is a relationship that you've been able to build with so many fighters along your journey. And I think that it's just an underrated part of the fight game because obviously I think most people who watch uh, combat sports look at that side of things is just like a business like this guy comes in on saturday uh he wraps my hands and he you know works my cuts until the fight's over and then we move we go our separate ways and that's that like he might be a part of my team but in terms of you know day-to-day -day or any relationship it, there wouldn't really be much one but with you that's a completely different thing um and you brought up uh that you showed up on a friday and i actually i was gonna ask this question later on but i'll ask it right now for you is there any like prep that you have to have during the week when you're working with a fighter? Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, you know, I do everything systematic. You know, I iron my clothes. I'm, I'm a big believer in going into with your clothes pressed. You know, I, I'm, I'm against wrinkle shit, you know. Uh, <laughs> I do that, but I get all my stuff, all the, let's say I'm working with Vladimir, yeah. all right? I get enough supplies to wrap hands for five fighters in case there's some changes or something. But people are always asking me to wrap their hands. So I always come prepared for that. I, I check all my medications. I, I go through my whole inventory, even though I know I have it, even though I know I did a fight before, yep. uh, the week before, you know, I go through it just to be systematic. But yeah, when I get there, I'm 100% prepped. So what day during fight week do you usually get into somebody's camp? Uh, well, good question again. Normally it's like a Wednesday or Thursday before the fight. Oh, wow. You know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I say, I'm, I just got, I'm like your insurance policy, bro. You know, I, I come in and, well, let's say I'm going to work with you for the first time. Yeah. All right. So, uh, but normally I get in Thursday in time for the weigh-ins on Friday and then the fight Saturday and then I'm gone. I'm like the circus, right? 
But during those times, uh, let's say I'm working with you for the first time. Well, like last week, and I worked with uh, uh, the six foot eight Ukrainian fighter, Andre could pronounce his last name, uh, that made his pro debut when Shane Mosley Jr. fought at Pomona. So I wrapped his hands oh. as a test run, right? Before the actual fight started, so that that way we made any adjustments and because everybody's different, but then it gives us that bonding opportunity. Yeah. Right? And uh, seems to work, man. The guys keep sending me messages now, <laughs> but it's from <laughs> Ukraine. And, and uh, which is nice because the wrist wrap that I have here that has the swabs, uh, I made it in the color of the Ukraine in yep. support for the Ukrainians. And I'll be wearing that, you know, for a while. And Lomachenko's in the audience and, you know, I showed him the wrist wrap and, you know, then it's from me to you guys and he understood. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm Again, that surprises me because, you know, again, you're, you're a cop man, but you want to be with the fighter and develop a relationship prior to fight night coming around. Yeah, it's a hurt business, bro. You know, yeah. and, and psychology is, is, is a big benefit. And psychology, you can learn how to wrap hands, you can learn how to work cuts, but you can't learn how to get into people's minds. You've got to have been there, done that, and understand their feelings. You know, and you go in under those conditions that I'm there to take care of you. You know, yeah. Caleb Plant. I'm working with Caleb Plant. He's fighting Benavides. And yeah. I, I go to camp. I'm not going to wrap his hands to the last week. Yeah. But I go there just to support him and, you know, to evaluate. And, you know, because they understand that, you know, I was a coach before I was a cut man. Exactly. So I understand the game. And I work with, you know, the best trainers in the world. So I understand, you know, what's going on. And I give them fair evaluations and all that because it's, you know, you got to give them every opportunity to win. That's the very cool part about your job is that you've been around long enough and done enough in your career and had enough of a of a uh, what's a, a wide palette, a big palette uh, that you can do other things other than just you know fix someone's cut in the sixth round of some fight. You know, um, I want to know. I know a lot of your past work, and you just mentioned Caleb Plants. So that's a good place to go off of. Uh, are there certain fighters today that you are consistently working with, like Shakur Stevenson? I guess is one of them. Um, but like, what's your current work flow look like? Busy. I, I gave up, uh, uh, should have been in Saudi Arabia uh, today. Okay. Uh, I was going to work with Badu Jack and, and uh, uh, Mason, uh, uh, Hasim Rockman's brother. Uh, yep. and, uh, and then they, but I couldn't because I'm going to the premiere. Uh, but they, uh -huh. also, they also called me to work with Jake Paul, right? Yeah. And so that would have been three, the, the three big fights of the night. And the prince wanted to meet me and all that, but I said, man, any other time I'd love to, but right now I'm going to the mirror. You know? <laughs> so, so it's nice to be in that position, right? Where, uh, you know, you could do it, but you know, they understood. Would you say you're pretty consistent every weekend in terms of jobs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did Shane Mosley Jr. last week uh, in Pomona and I was in Phoenix the week before. See, I, um, I work with top rank now. Okay. Because I was doing the bare knuckle fights with Dave yep. Salmon, the COVID kicked in and, you know, things changed. But during the COVID, Top Rank brought me and Mike Basil in as house cutmen uh, because you had to minimize people there. Mm -hmm. And they liked the program so much because we wrapped the fighters' hands. We worked all their corners. Top Rank paid us. They didn't have to pay. And then they had top of the line people, right? Yeah. So for me, it was a great opportunity. I lived 20 minutes from the MGM. So we did 18 shows there and they liked the program so much that they kept us on. So Shakir's part of Top Rank. Uh, Jared Anderson's part of top rank and there's just yeah so many guys just I get called all the time Nice, that's awesome. That's good to know. I, I wouldn't have known that information. So it's, it's good knowing that now um, yeah. And that brings me to you know with your I guess even in, in, in a cut man sense a decorated career What are some goals you have left or is it kind of just you know what whatever comes comes? Yeah, whatever comes, you know uh, Good question. Man. That's why you're gonna be <laughs> real good at this I am uh, Everything that has happened to me in my career, I, I've never asked for one job. Uh, I think maybe I mentioned that before, maybe I did, but I'm just a proud Mexican and I just can't kiss nobody's butt, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but they all come through me through performance and, and that's the way I want to keep it. But now there's a lot of opportunities, you know, they, they whatever comes, uh, I'll get to evaluate it. You know, I'm working with uh, uh, a company right now uh, on a cut cream for the healing process. Yep. CP cut cream. and has vegetable stem cell and other products and 
uh, you know, I'm working with them and that's like available at uh, Man for Higher Supplies, but everybody should have it, you know, just for the healing process and uh, it, it expedites it. And, you know, they have a tequila company that's knocking on my door. So I, I'll listen to all offers go and, and see what fits within my pattern and what don't. And, but nonetheless, I'm still doing what I love doing and, you know, how can you complain? <laughs> you can't. Right? Is there a no. is there a deadline? Is there a is there an expiry date on Stitch Duran? Like, do you know? Do you plan on doing this? Do you plan on dying in the ring or? You oh, know, so, yeah, yeah. No, it's you know I was coming about just the other day. I said when my mechanics start failing me, uh, then 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 you know going up and down the stairs, you know going through the wall, <laughs> doing all this, and you know <laughs> and, you know because you don't want to take advantage the advantage away from uh, from the fighter, right? Yeah. But but I'm teaching. I'll always be teaching and. And if anything is left as my legacy is that I taught and, and I made the game a lot safer, and, you know, working on with people uh, on the CTE uh, uh, dementia programs and all that. My, my daughter, Carla and Rose Gracie, uh, one of the Gracie families and these other group just uh, had these commissions approved uh, test on CTE when you get your license. Very oh. simple question, you know, you know, does uh, dementia happen if you do sparring? Yes or no? Well, yeah, it does. You know, yeah. uh, the alcohol and drugs do. You know, yeah. You know, the sparring in the gym. You know, all these very simple things, but it puts it in your mind through education. So, uh, yeah, that's what I I will continue doing that. Trying to still get all these fighters unionized or not unionized, but in an association with healthcare and 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 what I be not and and you know and and I've always been on that and. You know, when the UFC let me go, it made me kind of the face of the rebellion, so to speak. You know, Stitch spoke up. People still stop me all over the world. But about 23 years ago, I made a documentary called Boxer's Nightmare with this young kid, John Bartenhouse, that graduated from the American Film Institute. We, I knew nothing about film. He probably he knew a little bit about boxing, but we put a documentary together called Boxer's Nightmare that brought up all the issues that are happening right now. We discussed Mike Tyson was there, Manu Stewart, uh, Mike before he got his tattoo. I yeah. mean, go, but um, so anyway, going fast forward, John Barnhouse passed away a couple months ago and I hadn't seen this film in 15 years. And I looked at it and I'm thinking, wow, man, everything that people are fighting for right now, they were fighting for then, but they all had a, a solution to it. So you had Mike Tyson, I tell you, a week before he got his tattoo, Fernando Vargas when he fought Philly Trinidad, Eddie Mustafa Mohammed, uh, Emmanuel Stewart. I mean, we all these legends, Joe Cortez, Richard Steele, Mills Lane. And I look at this, so I encourage your listeners and you, uh, and John put it in YouTube. I don't know why he put it in YouTube. You know, he was going through his moments and all that, and but I don't care. It's available on YouTube. I encourage everybody to see it and you look at the problems now that were happening in boxing then is now happening in boxing and MMA and these guys had a solution but nobody's doing nothing about it and John did a great job we did it on a zero budget wow. and originally I mean you might be too young but we were going to do the film on Chuck Bodak the shaman of boxing he was my mentor as a cut man looked like Colonel Sanders worked with Julio Cena Chavez and Oscar De La Hoya and but we got so much footage, great, great footage, that we decided to make it as Boxer's Nightmare. Okay. And yeah, I mean, God, we got, uh, so I'm proud of what I did. Yeah. And so, but it just lets you know that I've been fighting for the rights of these fighters longer than people think, you know? <laughs> so it's yeah. not nothing new to me, but check it out. Have your listeners go to YouTube and check out Boxer's Nightmare. And please let me know what you guys think. Pass the word around, because. You know these poor fighters they're still you know getting screwed mm -hmm. you know and and uh like rocky rocky and the creed movies right they were talking yep. about him and in uh urban winkler you know but it happened to musicians it happened to everybody if you don't know the rules and regulations of business then it's easy to be taken advantage of you know so if we could educate these fighters on management on health on all that through some kind of programs that uh you know could be put out and why not the worldwide? Mark Radner, he was a commissioner for Nevada. He says, you know, get 25 cents off of every pay-per-view ticket sold and put it into an establishment where let's say you break your hand and 
in the gym and no insurance, well, boom, the ABC Associates Boxing Commissions uh, will, will pay for your, you know, very simple. Very, very, very simple. simple. Very simple. And there's a lot of money being made in this game and and uh, somebody has to step forward. So, yeah, man, take a look at it. And please, let's do this interview again. Let me know what you think. I 100%. We'll link it. We'll link it in the bio uh, when we when we post this interview. Um, speaking on that, continuing with the association and Jake Paul, actually, you know, he's someone that's also looking to do that. I want to know. I think he's partnered up with Anderson Silva, and I think they're still in you know communications and trying to figure this thing out. I want to know if you know you've been a part of those talks. I got Jake's number. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, uh, <laughs> it's just it's just a matter. Of that's one of the negatives of not going to Saudi Arabia. It would have been a great opportunity for me to face to face, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, but yeah, you know, and the thing about it, he's a strong voice, you know, Anderson is the uh, subject of what went on with fighters careers. You know, luckily he made money and, and he has a good manager as Soros, but I'm sure there's a lot of Brazilian fighters that went through the same thing that the Canadians are going through with Americans and just worldwide mm -hmm. is they're taking advantage, taking advantage of, you know, like one of the things real quick, is like management. See, fighters don't realize that a manager could get anywhere from one to 33 to 30%. Can't go no more than a third, but they never let the fighters know. And, you know, they'll sign you up for, you know, as a manager, I'm with 33 to 30%. And if all you're doing is phone calls, uh, that's not fair to you. If, if I'm paying uh, your, your rent, your training, this and that, I'm investing in you then 33 to 30% makes sense because down the road i hope to replenish see what i'm saying and exactly. these people don't know and it happens all the time uh you probably get yeah it happens all the time so the little things like that you know is say no you know i got rights and and the fighter should be present when your manager and the promoter are negotiating your dollars and 100 your advisor so and if you're just advising 10 15 percent so. exactly no Very i agree simple. Completely yeah. agree. And that's, yeah. I think that's the thing that's probably the biggest concern and what's holding, you know, boxing back from being uh, as mainstream as, you know, us fans and purists want it to be. Um, but moving on to, a, you know, lighter subjects, uh, female fighters. I feel like everybody talks to you and everybody wants to know the stories of the heavyweight champions and the world champions and all these guys. But female boxing right now has never been at a bigger point in its, in its uh, tenure. So I want to know if there's any female boxers that you currently work with. Yeah, I just, uh, we were in Dubai with Jessica McCaskill. Nice. Uh, she fought, I can't remember who she fought. And uh, yeah, so I've worked with her and I've worked with other, you know, girl fights. We were talking about them the other day. You know, when I first, uh, I started working the fights for Invicta, the MMA, all yeah. women fights, right? And I think, yeah, girls, shit, bro, they can fight. They'll yeah. give you top of the line fights, 100% top of the line fights. And uh, and same with boxing. You know, I saw the Serrano and that young girl that fought the other day. and. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's it's big. I've heard you talk in the past, uh, you know, the differences between boxing and MMA. And you had this funny line, you said, you said for a boxing fight, there's times I can just sit there with popcorn in my hands and watch the fight. But yeah. with MMA, I seem to be a lot more busy. Uh, I wanna know between the two, is that kind of like, a, I don't know, when you've done like a couple boxing fights in a row, week after week after week, you're like, okay, I need some more, need some more action. I'm gonna get myself into an MMA fight, or, or is it again just kind of like as it come as it goes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you know, no cut. You go, oh man, you know, <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, M &A, M &A, M &A, MMA, you know, for sure, you know, you know, you're gonna get work. But then I was doing the bare knuckle fights, and I was guaranteed work. Yeah, you know, and uh, so yeah, that's yeah. But sometimes you just kind of sit there and do. do, do, do. Yeah, Eric, but are those are those moments that you you kind of enjoy sometimes? You enjoy just being being able to be present and watching the fight? Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. You know, but like I say, I, I always always prepare for worst case scenario. Right. Yeah, there's times I'm I'm watching the fight, but I'm watching it and I'm also evaluating it as a judge. Okay. And, and then that way I keep score within myself. And mm -hmm. you know, Vladimir was talking about saving his career, right? So leading to that is the first fight I worked with him is he had just come back from losing his world title and he fought Devorah Williamson in, uh, here in Las Vegas at Caesars. So my first fight with him and he won the, he didn't look all that good. You know, he's with Emmanuel Stewart. First three rounds he won, but not impressive. The fourth round he gets dropped 
you know, so it's still a close fight. In the fifth round, he gets a big old cut here, unintentional headbutt. And I've worked on those cuts before, but I knew percentage-wise, that was the best time to stop that fight. He he was winning barely. Uh, it goes to the scorecards, right? So when the doctor came, I told Vitaly and, and Vladimir, look, you got a back cut, and I have the doctor stop the fight. You're, you're winning the fight, you know? Uh, so when she came, she goes, what do you think, Stitch? I go like this, and I open it up, stop the fight, went to the scorecards, he ended up winning the fight, and uh, saved his career. So yeah. the next day, the doctor called, and she says, I just want to let you know, I talked to Vladimir and Vitaly, uh, and Vladimir and Emmanuel Stewart, and the plastic surgeon says it was a good thing you stopped the cut when you did, because it was close to an optical nerve, and they would wow. create a double vision. So, Holy. yeah. 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 So. Wow. And I also heard the second part to that story was uh, the people in the other corner eventually saw you again and asked you if you did that. <laughs> you, yeah, you, you told them. <laughs> yeah, it, we're, we're friends. You know, the very yeah. well, so we're friends. I, I've been in, I, well, through Bones Adams and all that. And he said, man, golly, you know what I'm saying, man? It's <laughs> what I do, you know? So, yeah, yeah. that's how they all understood. But, you know, and same thing with um, Hector Macho Camacho Jr. when he fought Yuri Boy Campos. He was going back, Campos got a cut, and, and we're in El Paso, Texas, all Mexicans, and 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 I'm talking to Camacho Jr., and uh, he says, man, I knew I was gonna beat him when he got cut, and then all of a sudden, there's no blood, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so you kind of get those comments from those guys, so it makes a difference. That, yo, 100%, and I, I've heard you tell stories about uh, you're watching fights and you're like, oh yeah, he would have, you know, there, there's no reason why he should have been stopped that fight because if there was just a good cut man in the corner, we could have fixed that. He could have, he went on to win the fight. Um, and I, there's plenty of stories you can get into that, that, but the reason why we're talking today is, and the reason why you're missing Saudi Arabia, you mentioned it before, you're going to the premiere of Creed 3, you're in that one, I believe it's your fourth Rocky movie? Yeah, yeah. How has that experience been? Yeah, oh, great. Well, it, it was, I did Balboa and then Creed one, two, and three, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, what an experience, bro. But you know, I I was honored to, you know, I mean, I always say, how many people you know have done three movies with Rocky? I have. You know, I did yeah. Balboa, Creed one, Creed two, and how many people you know have done three movies with Michael B. Jordan, bro? It's and then playing myself, so yeah. it doesn't get much better. But you know, in in the second Creed, when I'm wrapping Michael's hands. You know, we're in his trailer by ourselves, and I'm telling him how proud I am of him and Tessa Thompson and Ryan Coogler, who wrote, directed it, and Steve Kappel that directed Creed Two, and and I'm wrapping his hands, his hands out here like this. He says, "Stitch, we went from being actors to writers, producers, directors." And he looks at me like I'm looking at you and says, "I'm directing Creed Three, and you're with me as long as you want." Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So yeah. uh, let's get the release date. Let's get you saying the release date. So uh, we give that plug. Yeah, it's uh, three three twenty three. So let me let me fast or let me give you behind the scenes stuff, which I can do. Yeah. Right? So I'm wrapping Michael's hands again, and he gets a phone call, and he has speakerphone on, and it's Denzel Washington. <laughs> I'll figure it out, right? Hey, what are you doing? I'll get my hands wrapped and this and that. And so Denzel asked him a question that I, I didn't know, but. He says, when is the movie coming out? And he says, what, November 23rd? I said, oh, good. He goes, he goes, traditionally, all the Rocky and Creed movies that come out Thanksgiving weekend. So I'm telling people, and, and that was the date. And uh, but he says something about uh, Black Panther coming out November, I think, 11th or whatever. So, uh, but next thing I know, Michael's doing some beat footage filming at the, one of the Ryan Garcia fights in Los Angeles at the Staples Center. And, excuse me. At the end, he says, all right, we'll see you guys 3-3-23. And I said, what? <laughs> you know what? It's March 3rd, you know. And uh, so we're filming again. We did six weeks in Atlanta and two weeks in Santa Clarita up in the mountains. And uh, I said, Michael, what happened? He goes, nah, you know, for Ryan Coogler, for Black Panther, good opportunity for them. And, uh, but 3-3-23, and I tell you, I work on numbers. And I thought that was so masterful. And uh, so, yeah, so anyway, uh, this Sunday and Monday, uh, my wife are going to Saturday, actually, to Los Angeles. Uh, Sunday, we're going to have the cast and crew. We're going to watch the film together. Everybody that was involved in the movies. Yep. And, and uh, the next day, uh, I got the red carpet uh, uh, in Hollywood. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I had to give up the Jake Paul, uh, Badu Jack fights, you know. Uh, but not a bad thing. 
No, of course not. That's amazing. That's awesome to hear. Well, we'll go with working with Michael B. Jordan in these movies. You've had him for three straight times now. What's your relationship with, like with him and how is it having him also be the director? Hey man, he tells me I love you and I tell him I love you. <laughs> you know, when, when we met the first time for this last one, we come out of our trailers and I go and we hug each other. I said, Michael, I'm just so proud of you and this and that, you know, so and so. We start choking up and, all right, man, bye. <laughs> you know? so, so we have a great, great relationship and that's why you know, he says, I'm I'm part of the team. You know, I'm one of the pillars. And that's what he said during the interview for my documentary. So great relationship. And he did that's a great job as a, as a director. The movie's awesome. That's amazing. That's amazing. And of course, how long do they plan? Like how many do you think, how many you think this is going to go on for? They're working on four. Okay. You know? And, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's fine with me. You know, I'll do another one. <laughs> Yeah, why not? You know, it's not it's not about the money. It's not about the prestige. It's it's an accomplishment that, you know, that I did. You know, I did and I did it well. And that's it. That's all it is. You know, the money, you know, comes in. That's fine. You know, it's not about that. Okay. And a couple, a couple last questions. One, Tyson Fury is obviously uh, looking to fight Alexander Usyk this year. You've worked with Tyson Fury in the past. Is Tyson Fury one of those fighters that you're consistent with? Like, you'll probably be at that fight with him? I don't know. You know, that's, okay. yeah, it's, I've done two fights and I think he's done one, two fights after that and he used somebody else. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. You know, I don't wait for, uh, you know, I don't wait for the call. I, I keep, you know, if you book it, you book it. If you don't, I'll go somewhere else. Fair enough. Uh, my last question, I asked this to most fighters and I'm, I'm curious to know what your answer is going to be because I've never asked a cut man, obviously the first cut man I've talked to and interviewed. Yeah. Um, and of course, I mean, that's, uh, if I'm going to start anywhere, it should be with, uh, Stitch Duran, but what would, what would be one word you would use to describe yourself? Uh, lucky. <laughs> lucky. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. The right place at the right time, you know, and it, you know, it's funny cause that's why I told Stallone, I said, I couldn't sleep at nights and said, I'm here with you, Ryan Coogler, Michael B. Jordan. He said, you earned it. And I thought, well, you know what? I, I did. So I've earned my stripes and, but I'm lucky you know, to be in that position, uh, to have accepted these offers that have been presented to me. You know, and I always tell people, and I think I told you before, that line we're scared to cross, if you don't cross it, you'll never, never get there. 